Welcome to another episode on the fossil record. It has been way, way too long since I made a new video. Uh, my name is Benjamin Berger, and in this video, I want to introduce you to Heliosus opophis. This is a cast of a new genus and species that we named uh, from some fossils discovered in 47 million year old rock layers deposited during the Great Eocene epoch when things were a little better than today. So this paper, uh, naming the new species, it actually came out back in March, just on the onset of the 2020 pandemic and quarantine. And I've not had the chance um, to discuss this discovery yet. So today, three months later, and since my, my last haircut, um, I thought I would talk about the new species while still here in lockdown and how it relates to the evolution of pigs. Now, there, there is kind of a, a misconception regarding the process in naming a new species. I think the public kind of assumes that a paleontologist will just coin a new name, write a paper, put it out there, submit, you know, like a press release, and, you know, kind of voila, you become instantly famous because you discovered a new species. Well, the truth is, naming a new fossil species is a lot of work, not only in finding the fossils and recognizing them as new, but also the process that goes into establishing the name and making sure that it is truly a new species never before described. And this takes years, and it can often result in mistakes when you realize the fossil belongs to another named species. So unlike biologists, um, paleontologists don't have access to molecular data like DNA and mitochondria. And we have to base our species on morphological differences. So differences in the shapes and sizes of the fossils themselves. So when I was first starting out years and years ago, I, I was going through the museum and I found a strange fossil mammal skeleton in the museum collection that had kind of a really unique humerus or upper bar, arm bone. And so I thought, you know, you know, this might be a new species. So I wrote a new, a short little paper and I submitted it. And I remember one of the reviewers commented that the bone was likely from a different animal than the rest of the skeleton. And the associations of the bones are probably suspect. And you know, they were right. Um, they are correct. The paper never got published and I did not discover a new species, but just a jumble of bones with the same catalog number. And I learned from the experience that if it's very easy to assume that you have something exciting and new when sometimes the explanation is kind of mundane. So in 2017, we were doing field work in an area that we've been collecting fossils from the Brigerian land mammal age, which is a period of time in the middle Eocene. And um, my wife found uh, a beautiful lower jaw, which we, this is a cast of it. And um, my, actually my girls found right next to it a really nice humerus uh, bone uh, that was next to the jaw. And the jaw was exposed enough at the surface that I was, we were able to tell that it was something really kind of exciting. So you see, this, this animal was a artiodactyl uh, based on the anatomy of the teeth and bone. But artiodactyls during the Brigerian age are mostly deer-like tiny uh, mammals about the size of a bunny. Uh, like the genus Aniacodon, which I found before. And this one was really big, strangely big, about the size of a, of a small cow. And they exhibited bulbous, robust teeth like that found in modern pigs and peccaries, which don't appear in the fossil record until the late Eocene, about 20 million years later. So we carefully collected and recorded this discovery, and we prepared the bones, and we began to study them. 
And through the process, I learned a great deal about the evolutionary history of pigs and peccaries and other pig-like mammals in the fossil record. So right now, I thought I would take you along the journey and learn a little bit about the fascinating fossil record of pigs and how this particular fossil that we found plays into that story. Now, molecular studies of DNA suggest that pigs arose very early and are genetically very different than other artiodactyls. So artiodactyls are the even-toed hooved mammals. So they're all united by having an even number of toes and fingers or fore and hind limbs, the end of the fore and hind limbs. And um, many of them leave cloven two-toed tracks when they walk. Uh, they also have a double pole astragalus, which is a unique bone in the ankle that helps them run more upright and in a sagittal plane. So that's swinging their limbs back and forth and allowing them to jump really high and very easily. Now, besides pigs, this group also includes uh, deer, uh, hippopotamuses, moose, sheep, cows, camels, llamas, pronghorn antelope, the whole African bovids, giraffes, and even whales and dolphins. And they are very diverse and very successful. So most artiodactyls that we know exhibit what's called a coelodont teeth. They're very high cusp teeth with these moon-shaped grooves and crests that allow them to chew grass and hard, hard vegetation um, with a lot of uh, grit. Now, besides whales, which appear to have lost that trait, pigs are the only other mammal modern group that likely never evolved the coelodont dentition. Instead, they have um, primitive, robust, crenulated molars that are adapted to crushing food like uh, roots and tubers and fruit, as well as some meat. Um, they're actually very similar to the teeth that's found in your mouth, uh, teeth that are designed for an omnivore diet. Now, pigs likely branched off this artiodactyl group very, very early in their history, likely shortly after artiodactyls first appeared in the fossil record at the base of the Eocene epoch, so around 55.5 million years ago, with a little genus called Diadexus. Now, there is a long gap between 55.5 million years ago, when they likely diverge from other artiodactyls based on genetic differences, until 34 million years ago, when they start to appear in the fossil record as modern pigs and peccaries. Now, there's, there's a lot of things going on in that gap of time. And we're going to be talking about the four four, four, four major groups of pig-like mammals, two of which are living and two of which are extinct. Now, the first family, uh, the living family, is the family Tazosuidae, which are the peccaries. They're also called the Havalidnas. And these little furry mammals, uh, little pig-like mammals, are known throughout the American Southwest, uh, like Southern uh, um, Arizona, uh, Mexico, but they also extend actually through Central America and South America. Well, not super taxonomically diverse, they're fairly successful, uh, even in towns and cities, and they can be found even in tropical jungles like in the Amazon in South America. Um, and they're really interesting because they're characterized by having a unique canine locking mechanism between their uh, upper canines and their lower canines. So here I have a skull of one of these little guys. And one of the really interesting things is that the lower canine right here is anterior in front of the upper canine, which is right here. And it locks into this groove right here. You can see there's a big, huge groove. Um, and this locking of the canines means that these peccaries had these very nasty bites as these sharp canines actually occlude with each other. And they can cut flesh and they can hold on really uh, tightly. Now the back molar and premolars of these guys are for crushing 
roots, um, grubs, fruit, veg vegetables, uh, designed for an omnivore diet. So they kind of resemble human teeth a little bit. Um, so these robust teeth we call bunidon, which is kind of very human-like. And these peccaries are, you know, they're known to eat uh, garbage, junk food. Um, however, these really sharp anterior canines here um, likely serve as protection um, against predators, as well as fighting between individuals. Now, our second living group are the true pigs, uh, the family Pseudidae, which are found in Europe, Asia, and Africa. And they've been exported into many farms around the world where they've also become wild and introduced into the Americas and Australia and many islands, as well as being uh, brought by sailors to these places. Um, and this group lacks these interlocking canines that peccaries have. And instead, the canines do something really bizarre. The canines grow into long tusks. And warthogs in Babarusa, which are, have the longest tusks, the upper canines are rotated dorsally to grow upward, curving into these raised sabers. Now, warthogs in Africa have long tusks composed of both the lower and upper canines. And these Teeth are flashy. They're used in interspecies fighting between males for mates, but also found in females where they're smaller and less pronounced. Now, domestic pigs um, have been bred to reduce the size of the upper canine and lower canines, although closely related wild boars and other wild pigs will actually grow their tusks out. Now, none of these will interlock as they do in peccaries with the upper canine um, and those uh, and true pigs being bent kind of upward. So the fossil record of pigs and peccaries extends back in time to about 34 million years ago. In North America, we have the earliest fossil peccary, which is called Parachurus uh, minor, uh, which appears near the Eocene Oligocene boundary and likely came over from Asia sometime in the late Eocene. It's a small peccary, um, but one that would become fairly successful in North America during the cooler uh, Oligocene period. In Asia, um, a few species of the early true pigs appear around the same time in the latest Eocene, about 34 million years ago, including Samosurus, uh, which is known from southeastern Asia. There are also a number of Bunidot fossil mammals from the Eocene Pongdong Formation in Malamar, that suggests that the record might extend a little bit deeper back uh, in time for true pigs in southeastern Asia. All right, now for the two extinct groups. So there's one group of extinct um, pig-like mammals. Um, they're really strange, and they appear around the same time in the fossil record, a little bit earlier. And these are the hell pigs, or killer pigs, that belong to the family Enteleodontidae. They first appear around 40 million years ago, and they become very successful in North America during the Oligocene epoch, uh, including the most famous killer pig, um, Archaeotherium. So these pig-like mammals roam the Great Plains of North America, uh, likely originating from fossils from the late Eocene in the Gobi Desert in Asia. While never diverse, they are abundant in the Oligocene rock layers of the Great Plains of North America. Uh, the largest of this group was Dinohyus, a uh, big, huge, giant pig that roamed the Great Plains around 22 million years ago in the early Miocene. It was actually the last genus of this group of Ateliodont pig-like mammals to have lived. The Ateliodonts do share some traits with living pigs and peccaries, uh, including a completely enclosed orbit or eye socket, which is found in true pigs, but not peccaries, uh, even number of toes and low broad crushing surface on their teeth. Um, they're built for an omnivore diet, um, a little bit more robust for more of carnivore uh, diet and more scavenging diet. Uh, the lower uh, canine, since anterior to the canine, similar to what you see in peccaries and pigs, 
Um, and they also have a lot of bony tubercles that extend from the lower dentary bone of the jaw and these big wide zygomatic arches that are similar to many pigs living today. Um, so there is debate whether the hell pigs are closely related to living pigs and peccaries or if they are more closely related to some other um, extinct group. Um, some scientists point to a group called the Anthrotheridae, which are large Anthracotheridae, which are large artiodactyls with wedge-shaped skulls um, that share some similarities with hippopotamuses and hippos. Uh, they seem to have come over from Europe and Asia during the late Eocene in the Shadronian Age, um, but they have coelodont teeth, which makes them likely a little more closely related to other artiodactyls and actually maybe close to the to the group that gave rise to whales. Now, the oldest known etiliodonts um, are known from the late Eocene, about 39 million years ago, and includes a genus called Brachiohyops. Um, and specimens of Brachiohyops lack a coelodont dentition. They're fairly primitive, and they um, look very robust. They have like wide peak-like teeth. And the lower second molar is the widest tooth in the tooth row, with the first and third molars being less wide. And the third molar kind of short. So Brachyhyops is a rare fossil known possibly in both Asia and North America and appears to have likely come over from Asia crossing the Bering Strait around 40 million years ago uh, when temperatures were warm. The climate was much warmer at that period and then became isolated in North America with the big cool down at the Eocene Oligocene boundary. Now, all of these fossils that we have discussed only go back to about 39 million years ago, maybe as far back as 40 million years ago, although they're very rare prior to um, 38 million years ago in North America. And most of these uh, groups are confined to the Shadronian land mammal age and into the Oligocene at the very end of the Eocene. Now, the fossil that we found is actually dated to 47 million years ago. So before all three of these groups had yet evolved. So we're left with whether this was an early pig, a peccary, or an ateliodont. But there's one other group of pig-like mammals, and they're called the Helohyidae. And they're not well known, but they should be, because they're, they're very, very cool. These lived between 50 million years ago, about uh, 40 million years ago, in that gap of time that we talked about. And this fourth and oldest group of pig-like mammals is the one that our new fossil belongs to. And these fossils are actually very rare, but they're, they're very interesting. They're named after a genus called Helohyus, which means the sun pig or the sun hog in Greek. Um, now, Helohyus is only known from a handful of specimens grouped into four species. So they're fairly small, about the size of a dog or cat. Uh, the larger species named Helohyus lentius is about the size of a sheep. And it's super rare. <laughs> we only know it from one single tooth, a lower third molar. And they're known from the Brugerian lamb mammal age here in North America, but are pretty rare. Um, in the later Uintan land mammal age, uh, we're getting into like 40, uh, 45 million years ago, there's, there's another member of the Helohyid called Achiridon, which is much larger, about the size of a hippo or small rhino. And a Chiridon is a really interesting animal because it's been hypothesized to be closely related to Androsarcus, the big pig-like mammal from the Gobi Desert. So if Androsarcus is a member of this group, it would be the sole member from Asia. Now, both Achiridon and Androsarcus lack a postorbital bar. They have large canine teeth with the lower canine sitting in front of the upper canine. 
and it's a cool looking beast known from both Wyoming and Utah from beds about 45 to 44 million years old. So there's a lot of debate whether Helohias and Achiridon should actually even belong together since they're so different in body size. Now there's one fossil that sits between these two in terms of body size, and it, um, it's a genera called Parahias. Now Parahias is very rare, only known from two specimens, um, both lower jaws, uh, one of which has been lost. And there might be an undescribed third specimen that I came across in my research, but we'll have to see. Now the first specimen was discovered by O.C. Marsh's crew back in the 1870s near Bitter Springs, Wyoming. And he named the genus and species Parahias vagus and noted its, its occurrence in the early Eocene beds. Now since other paleontologists um, since then have really argued that this specimen was probably not found in the, in the Middle Eocene or early Eocene, um, and must have been mixed up um, in the collections um, with younger rocks because it's just, it just looks too advanced for that time period. Um, in 1973, um, a geologist working in Wyoming reported a second occurrence of Parahias vagus that was found by the famous geologist J.D. Love in, 19, in the 1930s and collected and deposited at a museum. Now, Unfortunately, that specimen was lost, but there are pictures that exist that reveal its identification to Parahias vagus. And it's from the Brigerian Teepee Trail Formation in the Owl Creek mountain range. And these rare um, specimens um, appear very close to our new fossil specimen. Um, but both of them are, are larger, and many of them lack some of, the, some of the traits that we found in the teeth of this specimen. So uh, after showing our new fossil to a number of experts, we, we became convinced that it was something new and very rare. Uh, so we drafted a paper and we actually published the new, the new spe uh, species and genus as Heliosus opophis. So the genus comes from the Greek for sun pig uh, with the species named after the Egyptian god opophis who was the constant enemy of the sun god Ra. So in ancient Egyptian mythology, the sun god Ra would set, the sun would set, descend into the other underworld to battle the serpent god Opophis, and then each day return victorious with the morning sunrise. So a solar, a total solar eclipse um, uh, would be viewed as the vengeance of Apophis to strike during the day to sort of vanquish the sun. So in any case, my daughter picked out that name because for the species because we found the fossil the day after the 2017 total solar eclipse that occurred here in the United States. So now there's, there's kind of a lot of spookiness associated with this specimen when we excavated it. So right after we, we lifted it out of the ground, um, there was this weird windstorm that blew down on us and then it dispensed into the air like a soul being released. So the specimen, the actual specimen is now housed at the museum here in, in Utah and everyone is welcome to come and study it. Um, it's not on display, but it is in the collection space. Um, so one of the remaining questions that we have, major questions about this particular fossil um, and of Helohyades in general is how are they related to modern pigs? And my take on it is that pig-like mammals like, like this specimen were probably much more diverse and abundant during that gap in time between 34 and 50 million years ago. And they likely lived in uplands away from the lake margins and flood basins and other places where fossilization typically occurs. So, this specimen really kind of highlights a really sparse knowledge of the diversity of extinct life forms on Earth. And there's, there's a lot more of these fossils to be discovered out there. So I hope this short video inspires you to keep your eyes on the ground. 
Thank you so much for your patience during this time. I've been desperately wanting to make this new video on the fossil record. I've been trying to make this particular video since March when everything got locked down because of the coronavirus. Um, I've tried and failed to make some short videos in between uh, during this time, which were not very good, so I didn't post them. So I took my time with this particular video to make it the best that it could be, um, given all the circumstances. I think I've been delayed mostly by uh, another project that I've been involved with this year um, that has taken a huge amount of my time, like a giant vampire. Um, and that is writing a textbook for one of my large enrollment classes that I teach uh, here in Utah. So back in 2012, I was first started out making videos for a class called Integrative Physical Science, which morphed into a geology science class for incoming freshmen. And it's become my most popular class that I teach. And the process of, in the process of developing this class, I've learned a lot about making videos and a lot about online learning. And um, the students and I have been using an old, hardback, professionally published textbook that's really very expensive for the students. Um, so this year I've been replacing it with a free open online textbook that's available to the students uh, for free. And I've been writing it myself. And it's currently being finished, tinkered with. Um, as I've been writing about 2,000 words a day, racing to finish it before the start of the 2020 fall semester in August, and using it to develop this online class that I teach. And this means that I've been totally focused on that project and finishing it, rather than the more fun paleontology videos for YouTube and doing summer field work and all that sort of stuff. So please bear with me during this time as I'm finishing uh, to, uh, racing to finish that project and be done with it. So if you'd like to check out my free textbook, um, I have a link. It's available online as a wiki book. Um, so it's not about paleontology. So you might be a little disappointed. It's a general science primer for non-science students. Um, and the title of the book is The Essential Guide to Planet Earth. And it covers basically kind of eight major topics. Um, Earth's size, shape, and motion in space. Earth's energy, Earth's matter, Earth's atmosphere, Earth's water, it's Earth's solid interior, Earth's life, and Earth's humans and future. So it's, it's a, been a huge ambitious project, much more ambitious than I thought it would be when I started a year ago. Um, so bear with me as I try to post more YouTube videos in the future, um, which are a lot more fun, and I hope to return to making more of them as soon as this project is finished and things calm down for me. So thank you again for your patience and your support, and I'll see you around.